Okay, this is why I need my guys in the studio. Oh, brand. There we go. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Assembly Medina, and everyone tuning in with us today. This is our Let's Talk About It discussion. Um, I want to thank the Honorable Assembly Member Jose Medina for joining the discussion with us. How are you doing today, sir? Very good, Josiah. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you for coming. So today it's the Let's Talk About It Showcase uh, webinar. And of course, we got our tacos. So I want to shout out. Uh, we got Los pa uh, Palos Moriscos that I ordered from. And then I think the assembly member has Zacateca tacos. Am I correct? Correct. That's amazing. So uh, with this discussion, this is something that started back in 2019 with your introduction to Conrad Crump uh, so graciously that then brought me to the California Endowment. So I want to first think, thank you for that because something that you helped create is still moving and thriving in today's day and time. Glad to hear. Awesome. And uh, so without further ado, we're going to join into uh, uh, start off with talking about your roots within the community uh, of the Inland Empire. Um, first question we have for you, Assembly Member, is what has been a driving force for your creativity, success, and passion? Well, Josiah, I started uh, here uh, in, in Riverside as a teacher. I, I came to Riverside to attend UC Riverside and uh, graduated back in 1974. Um, and then soon afterwards, got my teaching credential. And, and education has really been my passion uh, here in the Inland Empire my whole adult life. Um, I had a short experience uh, in the Peace Corps in Colombia, South America, where I was able to teach young adolescent boys in a, in a prison. And it was that experience uh, teaching in the Peace Corps in Colombia that uh, ignited my passion for teaching. I came back, got my teaching credential at UCR and spent uh, 34 years teaching here uh, in, in Riverside schools. Um, went on and ran for the school board, first in Harupa and then at Riverside Community College. And now I'm in the uh, state legislature and I chair the uh, committee on higher education. So I, I would say that my life has been um, about education, about the power of education, um, seeing how education changes lives, right? And, and, and especially in, in my career of teaching, I saw what a difference uh, teachers of color made to students uh, at all levels, whether it be elementary, high school, or college. You know, I saw where teachers of color made a huge difference and what a connection uh, teachers of color have uh, in our schools. So that, that has been my passion, continues to be my passion. Man, that's, that's a beautiful statement and I look up to that. Uh, so that leads us to our next question. Please there, share a story or experience growing up in the Inland Empire that's very fond to you. Well, uh, I'm gonna share a story um, that, that sticks in my mind. I, as I mentioned, I was a, a student right here at UCR, and I point that way because UCR is just a couple of blocks from where I'm sitting in my legislative office. And I lived in the dormitory uh, at, at UCR. I lived at A&I, a dorm. And one, one year, um, a few of us wanted to go to Mexico, to Mexico City for spring break. And so I needed some extra money to be able to make that trip. Uh, to Mexico City for spring break. So I, I took a job cleaning Bob's Big Boy. And Bob's Big Boy is no longer here, but it's here, it used to be here on University Avenue, yes. um, where, where Starbucks is now. Well, that, yeah. that was Bob's Big Boy. And I would clean Bob's Big Boy from one in the morning to five in the morning. Uh, I'd be there uh, pretty much all night, you know, mopping, um, just cleaning the restaurant. And I would walk. I don't think I had a car then. So I would walk from the door over to Bob's big boy. And and it wouldn't, it would seemed like it never failed. Uh, I would be walking, you know, getting going to work, and I, I would get uh stopped, uh, pulled over by 
Riverside PD. And they, they would ask me, well, where, where are you going? And I, I would say, well, I'm going to work. I, I happened to have bigger hair back then. I still had hair. And uh, I don't know, you know. But that, that was an experience that I, I never forget. Um, later on, years later, when, when I went and, and was teaching high school here locally at Poly High School, uh, many of my own students, uh, especially Latino students, uh, would get pulled over by Riverside PD also. Uh, I think partly because of the way they were dressed. You know, for me, it was long hair, maybe the color of my skin. Uh, so th that, those, those kind of incidents stay with me and uh, also, uh, you know, make me have a, a, a passion to bring about a change in, in different areas in our society. That's amazing. Great story. Thank you for that story. That's, that's deep. Yeah, we, we sometimes uh, forget the ill wills that are still uh, in this realm that we're living in them today. Um, where we're being pulled over for our skin tone or the hairdo that we have, but our intent is whole is, is wholesome and righteous. Um, just like you said, you were just going to work. It's like, yeah. what am I doing? I'm going to work. <laughs> so yeah. Sometimes I would tell them, hey, would you give me a ride? And, and sometimes they would. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So now that leads us up to our next question that the viewers have asked is, Help, uh, help us understand, what does the Inland Empire mean to you and how can we force this dual county initiative uh, to bring San Bernardino and Riverside County together as one whole? Yeah, well, I, I have lived here now almost 50 years. Yeah, right around 50 years I've lived here uh, in, in Riverside. And, uh, and, you know, having gone to school here, having taught here, I also spent some time teaching at, in the Redlands Unified School District yeah. um, at, at uh, Clement Junior High out there in Redlands. Um, you know, we are one area. We are one inland empire. Uh, the county line divides us, but we, we have a lot of the same needs, whether it be in education. We have the lowest college going rate uh, in the state of California. Um, you know, we have issues with, with jobs. We both, uh, Riverside County and San Bernardino County, uh, have a shortage of high paying jobs. Uh, we, we all both have, uh, have our, our citizens commuting, commuting into Los Angeles and to other areas for higher paying jobs. So we face the same challenges. And so I, I am glad that we work uh, across county lines. I, I am a member of the Inland Empire Caucus in the state legislature, and we work together to try to solve problems in a, on a regional basis. Other other problems, you know, uh, air, right? Air, qual air quality, homelessness, many of the same challenges. So uh, we need to continue to work together uh, across county lines as, as a region. Yes, that's true. We are one Inland Empire. That's a great shout out. And I didn't pay you for that one, but that's uh, <laughs> one of our main campaigns uh, is one Inland Empire, trying to get people to work, to realize we're just one. Uh, yes, a county line divides us, but we need to work together because the same issues are spilling over region to region. You know, I, I would say we also share assets, right? Whether it's a uh, Cal State, uh, uh, San Bernardino, UC Riverside, San Bernardino Valley College, Riverside Community College. You know, we we also have a lot of uh, of of like I say, assets that that we have uh, here to make our communities better. Totally, I and mean, it's needed. The job increase. We were talking about that the other day. I deliver food, um, and to see how many people are transporting from the Inland Empire. Um, to LA County early in the morning, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Uh, it's like the brain drain is very, the brain drain is very serious in our region and we need to do something to address that immediately um, so that we could bring, up, bring our, our kids home and let them, you know, start here, raise here and grow here and build businesses here. So I thank you for making that a point. Yeah. 
Next, we're going to talk about your contributions to art. As you know, uh, Music Changing Lives, we're focused on keeping music and art alive for our region. We've been doing it now 23 years, and I want to thank you again for being one of the first elected officials to support us and to take us under your wing. So thank you for that too, sir. Well, thank you. The next question we have is maybe, uh, could you share the importance of Assembly Bill 392 and why you are an advocate to this bill and a co-author uh, to having it passed in our in our, our community. Yes. Uh, well, I mentioned uh, my experience as a, as a college student uh, with Riverside uh, PD. You know, not all my experiences uh, were negative, but I, I I did see, you know, growing up, um, living here in Riverside, uh, another memory that I spoke about at. Um, during the Black Lives Matter was first, one of my first recollections um, here in Riverside as a UCR student was an incident where Latino, uh, young Latino was shot here in, in Riverside uh, climbing over a fence. He was going over the fence, he was shot in the back. Um, you know, there probably was other uh, choice besides shooting someone uh, who's fleeing and shooting them in the back. And that led to a march. That led to a march from our UCR campus to the Riverside County Courthouse. Again, one of my first memories here of Riverside. Then if you go back 20 some years, just a couple of miles from where I live, you know, with my family uh, across the street from Poly High School at, at a local gas station, uh, Taisha Miller um, was shot by Riverside PD. I believe it was 21 times. And Taisha Miller uh, was a Rubido High School graduate uh, from Rubido, where, where both of my children went. And she was probably in her early 20s um, when she was killed uh, again by Riverside PD. Um, you know, again, uh, perhaps. Uh, better things could have done than what happened. Um, with that, uh, I, I was involved with my students in the in the marches and demonstrations that that followed uh, the Taisha Miller shooting, and we we saw uh, from that uh, a lot of good things, reforms come out uh, in Riverside with the uh, with the. Uh, injunction put on by the, I think, Attorney General with the community coming together. And we saw reforms, police reforms right here in the city of Riverside. And 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 I, I, I would say that since then, you know, things have improved in Riverside. So as we saw shootings of uh, especially uh, black young men across the United States, I, I, I was reminded uh, of things that we had seen in the 60s. And, and as I spoke with then uh, Assemblywoman Shirley Weber, I, I said, if I ever had the opportunity to do something about it, I would not hesitate. And I am uh, proud of being a co-author of that bill. I was probably among the first Latinos in the legislature to come on to that bill. When, when the governor signed the bill at the Secretary of State's office, I, I was there with Shirley Weber and the other co-authors and families. I was there with families of, of uh, you know, families who had lost uh, uh, probably their, their sons. And uh, I, I think it was a historical moment. Uh, that law about the use of force had not been changed in probably uh, over a hundred years and and the use of force right what law enforcement use of force and um, and I, I i will say that in my eight years in the state legislature uh, it is probably one of the most important bills uh, that we have passed in my tenure in the legislature and uh, you know I, I i know that it will make a difference in uh, policing in, in the state of California. That, that, that law uh, was a long time in coming. It took a lot of work um, bringing different communities together 
but it was an important uh, law and one that I'm very proud to have been involved in. Yes, truly. Thank you. We used that as well uh, with our day of healings that we've done uh, with my younger sister, Jessica Pruni um, from Just Be You. So thank you for that law. And we've now started to campaign and get our mayors and elected officials to join on with that bill um, because I know that's the second phase. So once they pass the law, guys, we got to do our part as our citizens and help push it uh, and get our elected officials to recognize it and, and enforce those laws. So thank you for your efforts. So that's a blessing that we have you here in the Riverside County. Um, and, and I know that law will save lives. Truly, truly. Yeah. So let's let's do that and let's make a campaign behind it with some art as well, um, which leads to our next question. Uh, what is your, your thoughts behind the beloved uh, actor Cheech Marine? And why do you think the Cheech Marine Center of Chicano Arts and Culture and Industry is so important for our community and others like uh, we now have Charles Bibbs that I think we're going to have the Bibbs, God willing, in Riverside as well. So talk to me about those and why they're so yeah. important. Well, art is important just you know it, i think art uplifts society um whatever form of art it is and as a teacher i know that you know that students who are involved in music and can play an instrument that they they expand uh their their performance in in high school academically right if you know how to play an instrument so arts just is uplifting of of everyone of humanity and and this being a black history month um, I, I was recently watching um, a short on, on, on the history of black art. And I think whether, whether we talk about black art or Latino art, um, we have not done a, a enough as a society to recognize both Latino art and black art. So when Cheech came to Riverside and offered his collection of Chicano art, uh, over 900 pieces that he's amassed, gathered, collected over the years. It was really exciting when the city of Riverside uh, accepted his offer to be the place, the city, where his art could be displayed. And uh, I, I was excited to go to the legislature and, and ask for and get $9.7 million dollars to help open the Cheech uh, here in Riverside. And now we saw recently the, the uh, city council uh, sign the memorandum of understanding with the Riverside Art Museum that will run uh, the Cheech. So we look forward to the Cheech opening up uh, in the fall of this year. And it will be unique. It will be unique uh, in the United States, nowhere that I know of is there uh, a, a such a collection on display of Chicano art. And I think it affirms uh, the importance of Chicano art, like the importance of African American art in our country. Cheech says that Chicano art is American art. And, and sometimes um, different groups are looked upon as different or outside outside of what outside of the the mainstream or not belonging and so um yes that kind of art has been ignored for too long and it will be uh, a, a treasure for this whole region uh, it'll be a, a, a asset to the educational communities so that so that we can learn all of us more about chicano art and so that it is appreciated and, and taught and, 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 and just uh, also a way of recognizing the importance uh, of the contribution of Latinos in our society and to pay respect to Latinos in our society. Truly, yes, truly, that's, that's real. Um, I can't wait to the ground opening and hopefully we can do some things by that time to gather and have it safely. Um, to where we can go into the museums again. Um, I'm a strong believer that if Walmart's open, Target's open, our museums need to be open. Um, hey, so. <laughs> I, I just had a, a, the same conversation with a woman uh, advocating for the arts in the state of California, uh, advocating for funding 
for the arts and she said exactly the same thing this morning wow. our conversation that's so my we, 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 we look forward and and we'll push the governor to to at least give us guidelines so that we know when museums can reopen again safely truly truly uh, that's our good friend julie baker um, yes Californians yes. for the arts You're i sit right. on the board with her when she's seen that we were having our discussion she shouted me out and said, I just talked to Jose Medina and I told her, look at the universe. It's really working. Uh, and we're in our right lane and, and doing our due justice, um, which leads to our next question is how can we move music and art forward in the assembly with you guys? Um, I know you're a firm believer in the arts. What are some of the ways and key things that you see this year? And are there any like future uh, policies that we should be looking out for to help support the arts and help you get the governor to give us a safe reopening um, for the arts? Right, right. So as you mentioned, Julie Baker, the California, what is it, Jeremiah? Californians for, for the arts. California for the arts. Right. She talked to me about the importance of funding. Uh, uh, the funding proposed in the governor's budget um, and, and how that can trickle down, you know, to the local level. Uh, very much needed. I understand how the arts have been at, at, across the board hit hard by this pandemic, that some of the programs that have been uh, here before, um, you know, are not able to move forward. So I, I will very much support uh, the, the governor's uh, budget uh, items for the arts. And I sit on a joint uh, committee of the arts and, uh, and, and sitting on that committee, I'm able to advocate more for the arts in California. Awesome. That's, that's beautiful. We need that. We had a Facebook user and we got some comments that come out. One says, uh, we can open with restrictions 10 to 25 people at a time. Uh, and then another one of the questions that I'd like to pose that I just seen come in is uh, what do you propose to keep the talent here? We talked about the brain drain with people leaving. Uh, what, do, what do you propose to bring more hiring paying jobs to the Inland Empire um, currently? We have uh, uh, less than a mile from here, uh, the opening soon of the California Air Resource Board. Uh, it's it's just down the street from my office, just down the street from Zacatecas Cafe, um, very close to the UCR campus. And that California Air Resource Board uh, opening will be about, I believe, over 300 uh, very uh, high paying um, jobs right here in, in Riverside. Um, it's those kind of jobs that we need, you know, in, in the California Air Resource Board opening, I was in discussion with, with them on how important it is to reach out to graduates and students of both Cal State San Bernardino and UC Riverside, because we have the talent, as you say, you know, we have uh, uh, Latino, African Americans getting degrees in science from, uh, both UCR and Cal State San Bernardino in all areas of science. But as you say, many of them will go outside, you know, uh, even out, leave, leave the state of California for jobs. And I think we need to do two things, continue to, to work with the schools to, to make, create an even stronger pipeline for those kind of jobs in science, in engineering, uh, but also try to bring some of this, the young people who have left our area back. And uh, I, I, I talked to them about uh, apprentice kind of programs and also trying to make it easier for uh, folks to, to apply and get jobs, uh, even with the state of California, as that is. So I, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. And, and then uh, besides that, uh, you know, work, working uh, with local uh, cities to try to bring in uh, more entities like the California Air Resource Board that are high paying jobs. We can't just have warehouses in our area. Truly, 
Um, with that, that brings me this is kind of off, but with the many a plethora of warehouses that we have that are just abandoned, um, how can or how do you see us working with maybe grassroots organizers uh -huh. to convert those warehouses into useful spaces? Right, right. You know, I have had, uh, like you say, uh, uh, grassroots people, um, mothers come right here to this office and say, you know, there, there has to be more for our children. Um, you know, uh, a, a job in the warehouse um, could be a good job, but, but that isn't and should not be the limit. Um, so I, I think it's incumbent upon both cities and myself to uh, continue to, to uh, monitor the number of warehouses in our area. I, I've introduced different legislation uh, to give more control to, to, um, to, to see if, if, if warehouses actually do what they promised, did they bring the jobs that they said they were going to, um, is there advancement, are they making the money that they said they, ha they can, and, and at the same time, like we've said, bringing back um, other jobs as well. So Truly. that there are choices. So there are choices for young people as, as to where they want to go um, economically here in our own area. Truly, truly. One of our viewers says, let's connect with UCR. Uh, so <laughs> they said, we're going to commit you to helping us figure how we can work with UCR. Because again, this is let's talk all about it. And we want to talk about ways we can create solutions, not just complain about the problems. So I love the dialogue that we're getting thus far as well. You know, I, I would give a shout out to Professor Ron Leverage, uh, mm -hmm. who's always out on the forefront kind of advocating for his students. Uh, saying that that the state needs to do more, that UCR could do more, uh, both, uh, and and making sure uh, and connecting uh, students with jobs. And so I just want to give a shout out to Ron Leverage because he really has uh, the uh, you know the of his students, the well-being of his students, and the future well-being of his students uh, always in mind. Yeah, he's a great individual. Shout out to Ron Leverage. I love you, buddy. It's always important. Always asking how we can do more and then yeah. coming up with solutions as well. It's not just that talk when you talk to Ron. So I love that about him and you as well. You, you, you're a great man of your word. So I love this discussion that we're having. Uh, what are some of the changes that we can uh, um, expect from you in the coming years? Uh, we've had a lot of transition and we've got a new president, new vice president. Uh, what are some of those changes that you want to see for Riverside and California and uh, the whole United States? Right. Well, you may have heard of, of my uh, work in trying to uh, change uh, education at K-12 high school with the introduction now for the third time uh, of, of, of my legislation to make ethnic studies a high school graduation requirement. It, it's been vetoed twice, uh, but this time I, I know that the governor uh, wants to sign it. And, and given everything that we saw in this last year, um, Black Lives Matter and the um, murder of George Floyd, uh, it's more important now than ever uh, that we have ethnic studies. We saw the governor sign Dr. Weber's bill to make um, ethnic studies a requirement at the CSU. Uh, we had long conversation, the governor and I, uh, that he wants to sign my bill to make ethnic studies a high school graduation requirement for the high school. And I think we're gonna see that uh, this year, the governor signing that bill. Uh, I'm very proud that Riverside Unified School District has already adopted ethnic studies as a high school graduation requirement. And, and let me uh, just uh, congratulate uh, Renee, uh, Renee Hill for being the next superintendent uh, of Riverside Unified School District. We need more individuals like her uh, it is time for change, and I know that Renee Hill can bring about some of those kind of changes uh, that the district in Riverside Unified and probably other districts so badly need. So uh, things are coming together, as you say, and we totally. will be seeing changes. 
uh, this year and in the years to come. I love it. I love it. That's a great thing. And then one of our viewers says, Bez, he says, artists are great for high tech, great paying jobs. They are very creative and much needed. Yes, that is true, Bez. And I want to add that we are also second responders. Uh, so this is another thing, right? We got the first responders uh, that come out, they solve the issues, but then the artists we say are second responders. How can we work to get them respected as so, um, and also the organizations in our region that are doing so much of the work. Um, I say all the time, if if organizations and grassroots nonprofits held a strike, cities and governments would be in trouble. Uh, we're the only ones that stay in full throttle, get our hands dirty and stay in that mantra. So how, how do you think we could go about getting arts organizations and small grassroots organizations recognize like the police and fire because we play such a, a strong part in our community. So in, in my short discussion with Jennifer Baker this morning, she mentioned the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. I hope I got that right, WPA, which happened during the 1930s, during the depression. And I mentioned to Jennifer that when I was teaching junior high, not far from here at Shamawa Middle School, one of the murals that was painted as part of the work project administration under Franklin Roosevelt during the depression still sits there. In, in, in Sacramento, a huge mural in one of our meeting rooms also painted of California, also painted from that same time. So, so Jennifer pointed out and, and I know that during the Depression, Franklin Roosevelt had, had the, uh, the foresight to harness artists, as you say, Josiah, to do works, paintings, but he didn't limit it to that. I think there were plays produced, and that was part of getting the United States back to work. Uh, Jennifer pointed out that in the governor's budget this year, there will be a similar project, money to pay and fund different uh, artist groups uh, to continue the work that they've done. And, and, and she mentioned things like um, creating coloring books, creating coloring books for the community by groups of, that are part of the community to cover things like COVID-19. What are the things that need to be done uh, for, to, to prevent the spread of COVID, uh, encouraging uh, people to get the vaccine? So th there are, and I'm, I'm really uh, happy to see uh, minds coming together uh, of looking for creative ways of how you can use the arts to um, motivate, engage the public uh, in different things. And, and if it would be, you know, what steps do they need to take uh, to prevent the spread of COVID or, or how they can uh, be, uh, make the vaccines more accessible or to perhaps uh, that we talk about vaccine, um, um, somewhat to alleviate uh, fear of getting the vaccine, uh, those kind of things. There are certainly creative ways that art can be uh, employed and it should be. You know, um, I, had, I had the opportunity right before the pandemic to go to Cuba, to travel to Cuba with a, an, another, um, another assemblywoman. And it is my second time to travel to Cuba. And you can see, you can see right above me and maybe I can, right above my chair, there is a, a poster on my wall, right to the left of me, behind me. And it is a Cuban poster of a Cuban film from the 1960s. Uh, and you know, art um, in Cuba, in this sense, a, a movie, uh, used to to look at Cuban society. Another poster in my hallway is another 
a Cuban poster um, celebrating the visit of Barack Obama to the island of Cuba. And these are Cuban artists uh, who make these posters. This one right here above me and the one, and I, I wish I could show you the one of Barack Obama because they are iconic posters of, of, uh, by Cuban artists, a very uh, famous, popular. Some, they remind me of, of uh, the posters that have come out um, like we would see in the Cheech Museum um, of the Chicano movement. So how art just uh, has a, a role, an important role to play in society and in change. And, and we need to continue to support that. And I will, I will do everything I can to support that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, um, most artists, we just really need a hand up and not a hand out. It's, we're ready to do the work. As one of the users said, we're very creative um, and look to do things in the future. Uh, one of our users as well said, the, uh, emergency funding for states is a part of the President Joe Biden's COVID review, relief bill. This will help keep California budget balanced, no higher education tuition increase, no state work layoffs. Um, so hopefully that's what we could get to because we want to know too, uh, what are the numbers for our unemployment rate right here in the Inland Empire? Um, you constantly hear them talking about the state, but in cities like Riverside and San Bernardino County, uh, we've been hit very hard with the issues. And so to do revitalization projects and things to come beautify our community is really needed um, at this moment and artist spaces are, are key. Um, you so know, I, I, I would recognize the art that was done at the uh, at the new at the groundbreaking of the uh, social justice um, mission uh, project that Rose Mays uh, uh, involved in that I was able to bring in funding as well. Those murals that were painted around those were beautiful, and it was so sad to see uh, someone um, you know damage them and. Um, and I know that they were removed, but that, that kind of art needs to happen, continue to happen. Totally. And we look forward to continuing that. Um, uh, that's a, again, a shout out to the artists. Uh, they call themselves the five. Uh, it was five artists that painted that mural. We started the campaign to help fund that. So thank you for supporting and, and getting some funding to help pay them because initially they were doing it for free. Um, uh -huh. And as you see, that was a very beautiful mural. Um, and so these are ways that we need to, again, respect what artists are bringing to the table and pay them what they're worth. So I thank you for being a part of that campaign. Um, and then another statement, um, uh, just with a touch of art. Uh, so uh, Jane, uh, we got James Baldwin behind me. That's created by one of the artists. Yeah. And it said, he said, uh, things can, some things can never be changed. Uh, but things can't be changed until we face them head on. Uh, so I thank you for facing the issues head on and coming up with solution to change the issues um, during Black History Month and others as well, uh, Mr. Medina. Um, this leads us to our next question that we got for you. Um, what organizations would you re recommend to young youth um, to utilize to get the support they need in today's time? To, to get the support that they need. Yeah. yeah, like what's yeah. some of the top organizations that you would shout out to uh, for the Riverside youth to go get involved with that right. some people may well, not know? If if they're high school students, I, I would point them to organizations like BSU and Mecha, both. I, I happen to be the Mecha advisor at Poly High School for many years. Um, someone, a, a close friend with close connections to um, – to Riverside and Riverside Poly. Now, uh, Los Angeles Supervisor Holly Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Holly Mitchell was state senator. And what a lot of people may not know is that Holly Mitchell was a graduate of Riverside Poly High School. And when Holly was moving over to LA County Supervisor, she posted a photo of her first visit to uh, the state capitol. Mm -hmm. And that visit, I believe, happened with Del Roberts, who was then the advisor to BSU. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Holly, that was her first time 
visiting the state capitol. So I, I think that BSU and Mecha are two places in high schools where students can get leadership kind of training uh, that are that are very important and connect with adults, uh, faculty uh, who who uh, you know maybe look like them and uh, would be able to lead them and inspire them to be leaders themselves. Uh, other other organizations, uh, Blueprint for Diversity. I think uh, Aaron right here in my office is a graduate of that program. And every year I go and speak to them. Um, and that is a great program and, and creates uh, good leaders that we need. Uh, for Latino students, uh, Latinas, there's hope a program called Hope, Hispanas Organized for Political, I don't know, Change, but they do a conference every year. Also a, a good uh, organization to connect with. The group in Riverside and uh, also Latino Network, all great organizations. Totally, yeah, uh, those are some dynamic organizations. <laughs> we do gotta get other students involved, I think. Now, especially with this pandemic, we had a great movement building before it uh, where people were getting engaged and we got youth volunteering. And so we need to find ways to bring those elements back virtually. Um, and then one of the Facebook users uh, graciously said, one of the distinctive aspects of the Obama campaign was the abundance of music and art programs. It helped inspire many young people to, and minorities to vote. That's very true, I think. Um, and shout out to LULAC. Yeah, we love LULAC too of Riverside. Thank you. I forgot, I forgot LULAC, didn't mean to. <laughs> hey, can, can, can I mention the, the Obama campaign? Yes, of um, course. Lenny Bailey. Lenny Bailey, uh, a young, you know, not so young as not individual from Corona, UCLA grad, but Lenny Bailey and I uh, were instrumental, the both of us working together to open the Obama headquarters here in Riverside in the early days of the Obama campaign. And so uh, we both were able to participate in the Obama uh, campaign leading to his election. And it was musicians, right? Mus musicians like Will I Am, and if you remember the video that that, that he helped probably produce, and the artwork, the poster of Barack Obama and Hope. Hmm. So he really did channel. He really did channel uh, art, culture, uh, leading up to his election. Recently, I, I had a chance to see a CNN special on President Jimmy Carter, someone who people may not, you know, think of, of being, uh, you know, like a cool guy, but he did the same. He brought music into his campaign uh, and he, he points to uh, folks like the Almon Brothers band to help, uh, you know, get him elected as well. So again, every time that we have an opportunity to use art, uh, we need to. Totally, totally. And uh, as well as having the mentors like yourself that go out and actually build the campaigns. I remember when you brought Antonio Varagosa out here uh, when he was running and you got us all together and you asked us, what do we think uh, before you just introduced him? And so we need more leaders engaging us like that. And that's why I wanted you to be one of the first because you're one of the realest uh, elected officials. Um, I can remember several times that you sat us down and you had meetings to say, you need to talk to this person or to that person. And that kind of going to like Conrad Crump's story uh, when Jarrell and yourself told me you need to meet this kid. I don't know if you knew this, but I searched for him for about two years uh -huh. and I was never able to get him because he had lost his phone. And then one day, uh, California Endowment came to do a site visit at one of our studios in River, and it was Conrad Crump and Carlos Molina, uh, Molina that was on the tour. Now, 
at this time, the Conrad Crump name, it had left me because <laughs> I that was two years ago. Um, and it wasn't until after a year later that we're sitting down and eating um, and he's telling me his story of working for you in the assembly and everything like that, that I realized, oh my God, you're Conrad Crump that Jose Medina told me to go meet. And by this time he knew me genuinely, but it was that aha moment that we both had that always reminded me we have to learn to communicate and network. Uh, we have to go to our elected officials and ask as their constituents, what should we be doing to advance our mission forward? So I want to thank you for always lending that helping hand and giving us that advice that we need as, as leaders in this community. Yeah, no, I, I think that shows what a small world it is. And as you say, uh, the importance of, uh, of mentoring. Uh, Conrad uh, has added a lot to uh, to my office, and uh, I, I I miss him still, but I know he he moved on to bigger and better things. Truly, he's at the governor's office now, <laughs> state yeah. level. So you you're doing it. Uh, shout out to Aaron too, Israel, Aaron Dill, man. He's next, man. Uh, you, yeah. you you're out of your office. I mean, you you're submitting win uh, winners. Sabrina Cervantes. Uh, shout out to her. I remember when she was working for you, yeah. uh, we came in, uh, and then, uh, the mayor now of Riverside used to work with you. Um, so it seems like if you work with Jose Medina, you're destined for greatness. So let's keep that momentum going. I, I, I've been fortunate and am fortunate to have very good people that have worked for me and worked for me both here in Riverside and in Sacramento. Truly. Truly. Um, so our last question, uh, how can we at Music Changing Lives uh, count on you in the future? And what are some of the ways that you think we can get involved now? And also, thank you for your nomination uh, for Nonprofit of the Year as well last year. Thank you for that. Well, much deserved. Well, I, I will always be uh, here to support Music Changing Lives, uh, whatever I, I can do to add uh, my voice, uh, as, as you said, I, I'm one who very much uh, values the arts in all forms and recognizes the work that you have done, that your organization has done in the community and the importance that art plays in all our communities and, and how it can uh, uplift and change the lives of young people. So please always count on me as a supporter. Awesome. Well, Assembly Member, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been an honor to meet with you. And in this pandemic, I can't wait till it's over so we can meet in person again and go to lunch. Uh, but I'm just honored to have spent time with you and been mentored by you throughout these last years that we've worked together. And congratulations on another year. And let's continue making great success. And as you say, changing lives together. Um, so thank you so much for joining us on today's show for Let's Talk About It. Again, we want to shout out the small support, small local businesses, people. OK, so we got Paulos Moriscos uh, tacos that I got. And then the assemblyman has uh, Zacatecas Tacos in Riverside. Zacatecas uh, Cafe. It's cafe, yeah. So stick with small local people. Stay home. Be safe in this pandemic. Wear a mask. And always, as we say, be the change. You are enough, and we are the ones that we've been waiting on. We thank you for joining us on this show today. For Let's Talk About It, look out for the next one. Again, Assemblymember Medina, thank you so much, sir. We look forward to the next one. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right.